Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. This is Dr. Kerry Gell, uh, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. And today we have an amazing guest. He's a visual neuroscientist, a doctor, uh, Dr. Randy Hammond at the University of Georgia. He's a full professor. And I really, I wanna thank you for being here. I do wanna say something about PhDs who do research. You know, I touch one person, one patient at a time when I see patients. PhD researchers, they do the research so the doctors could have the research to be able to give the, re the, the information to the patients. So he's, he's helping thousands of doctors, helping millions of people through his research. So I really want to thank you for dedicating your life to helping so many people. Well, thanks. So please explain to me what a visual neuroscientist is. Yeah, so so my uh, my training, I, I uh, I'm a at the the University of Georgia. I teach a big class on uh, health to the pre meds, and the basis of the class is, is sort of uh, acknowledges the fact that behavior has such a leading role in a lot of major illnesses now. So if you go back a hundred years ago, it was all infections, and but now it's you know, chronic diseases like cancer and cardiovascular disease and stroke. So just behavior has a ton to do with health, but it also, of course, has a ton to do with, with the brain. So, so studying the brain is uh, a big, a big uh, part of what I do. But of course, the major input to the brain is the visual system. So it's, it's, uh, it's one of those weird paradoxes that only about 10% of seeing is is really the visual input of the eyes itself it's it's you know everything we see and experience is sort of a recreation of the brain of, you know by the brain so it's it's weird to think of the fact that you know sound waves don't really have sound there's no reason why you know the compression and rarefaction of of, of air should sound like Dee! it's it's our brain that creates that of course and uh, and it's the same it's the same with vision. I mean, if you think about the fact that you know the optic nerve, there's no visual input in that area. That's why they call that spot the, the blind spot. But you know, I mean, we have a big hole in our vision all of the time, and so a good part of what we see is completely recreated by the brain. Or 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 take blinking. You know, if if I turned the the light on and off in this room in the same frequency that people blink, they would totally notice the light going on and off all the time. But you don't notice your blinks because the brain corrects for that. Or every time you're looking at something, you know, you scan it and uh, your eyes are jumping from one spot to the next, That's, those are saccades. But if you can imagine a camera jumping that fast, the image would be terribly blurred. So, uh, so we have this situation where we have you know, a, a very poor camera, which is what our eyes are basically are, jumping around with a big hole in the hole in the center, and uh, and and the brain takes that input and creates the very you know the very colorful and and filled filled world that we have. So the the brain is integral to seeing. So people who study the vision system as a whole really study the brain. And one thing that's been really good about studying vision it's just one of the best neurological system workout systems in the body so we know you know nearly everything about how it works uh, for for way before you know functional mri and all these very advanced neuroimaging techniques there was the ability to take little tiny electrodes and and record the activity of, of specific neurons in the brain and so over the years people did that in just painstaking detail they would have animals and they'd fix their vision and they'd just record from individual cells all through the system. And we just worked it out. 
So, so now it's sort of the model system that we use to understand pretty much every other system. So one reason why I started studying, you know, vision specifically was just for that reason. I was interested in aging and health in general, and I had gone uh, to Harvard Medical School, so I was interested in just health. But, but vision turns out to be the perfect model for just studying health. You know, take, if, you, if you use one example, the, uh, the crystalline lens in the front of your eye is the only, only tissue in your body that doesn't undergo biological renewal. I mean, once you're, those, those cells in your crystalline lens are the cells you're born with. So you can, you can measure various aspects of the lens and that, that, can, that reflects you know, a, a lifetime of oxidative stress, et cetera. So it's a very, it's a very interesting tissue to study from an aging perspective. Or if you take the, the retina, which is the neural tissue in the back of the eye, that's, a, you know, that's just a little piece of brain. So everything that goes on in the brain in terms of dementia and all these other conditions are reflected in the retina, as, you, as you've noted so elegantly yourself. So by studying the retina, it tells you a ton about the brain. So, so the sort of segue between vision and neuroscience was, is a very natural one. What are some of the behaviors or the, the worst behaviors that people do that make them age quicker and that we could also see some of those clues through the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, I think that one of the things that people forget is that is that you know of all the you know of all the tissues in the body, the brain is the most metabolically active tissue there is, and the retina is the most metabolically active part of the brain. So, pretty much anything you do that affects your metabolism is going to affect those tissues very very early. It's sort of for example, like you know your brain is something like two percent of your mass, but it gets like twenty five percent of your caloric energy, and and your respiratory. Uh, function. So 20-25% of your oxygen goes right up to your brain. That's why when you stand up really too quickly, you, you get kind of vertiginous, is because your brain just needs so much oxygen. Or if you go just slightly up in elevation, you get dizzy. And I mean, just a tiny change in uh, oxygen concentration is immediately felt by the brain. So, so things that affect your body dramatically impact your brain. So your diet obviously is a big one, but but, but big in the sense of you know, your brain's about 60% fat in terms of its of, of, uh, solid content. And so the kind of fat in your diet directly reflects the kind of fat in your brain. So this idea of having a mega fatty acids in your diet, for example. Mega fatty acids are very fluid fats that allow information flow across membranes very efficiently. Saturated fats, like in red meat, are very... Uh, stiff fats that are not very permeable. So if your brain has a lot of omega fatty acids, if your retina has a lot of omega fatty acids, information flow is very efficient. And if it doesn't, it has less, much less so. So, uh, so just that different in fat intake dramatically affects how your brain functions. You know, so, so for instance, if I went outside and ran around this building really fast and I came back in and I was out of breath, all that oxygen immediately signals uh, biochemical differences in my brain. And so, you know, your brain has hugely vascularized. So things that affect your cardiovascular system, exercise, immediately and dramatically affect your brain. And what it does is it sort of cascades the change. So you, it starts biochemical change that then promotes, you know, epigenetic change in the cells and just changes your brain. So a lot of the poor health behaviors that people, you know, engage in, just poor diet and, and sedentary lifestyle, all that stuff, you know, affects not only their body in a visible way, you know, affects their skin and the, whether they have a, uh, you know, whether they're overweight or not, but but what they don't see is all the all the changes that's, it's, that that are occurring in their brain. So what we can do in our lab here is develop behavioral tests and other neurological tests that, uh, that show those very large changes in the brain. And what's, what's interesting is that you can see them you know, in undergraduates at the university. So these are students that you know, you're at the sort of peak of your intellectual life 
when you're an undergraduate in college. But these, uh, but we can measure huge differences in these undergraduates just based on their dietary behavior, on their you know, exercise behavior, et cetera. So it's impacting them already. How can we use the eye as a biomarker to tell us about the brain? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. So, so the eye is, of course, uh, a, an amazing biomarker. So just to, just to use a few examples, so when, when, when people get very early uh, uh, signs of uh, multiple sclerosis, say demyelinating disease, one of the very first things that happen is their uh, optic nerve gets inflamed. So that's optic neuritis is the name for that. So because, and, what, and the reason for that is myelin is, for, what myelin does is make neural transmission faster. So if you get any change in myelin whatsoever, that immediately affects the efficiency with which information goes down the optic nerve and starts affecting the optic nerve. So people with very early uh, MS start having visual symptoms. So uh, similarly, when people have uh, various degenerative conditions like, like oh, uh, dementia, that's comorbid with, other, with retinal degeneration or cataracts. But even way, 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 way younger than that, you can do things like measure processing speed. So what I mean by processing speed is, if I turned the light on and off in this room, I could do it faster and faster and faster and faster, and at some point it would, it would look solid, like it's not flickering at all. And that, that point is called the critical flicker fusion threshold. And that, that varies just dramatically across subjects. Some people can see their, their critical flicker fusion threshold is way higher than other people. And of course, in older subjects, it's very low. And people getting early dementia, it's very, 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 very low. And so it's really easy to measure. You just increase the speed of flickering until it looks like it's not flickering anymore. And uh, what we found is that even in very young people, the, the difference is by a factor of two or three easily. So some people can see things flickering twice as fast as other people can see. So, uh, so we could make a huge difference with that just by dietary changes, for example, which, which formed the basis of a study that we did on our baseball players. One way to test uh, sort of the efficiency of, of processing speed is to look at athletes because athletes have to have really good visual and visual and motor function. So if you're a basketball player, for example, you're kind of bopping around the court and you have to estimate from a visual perspective the distance between your hands and the, the basketball hoop while you're moving and you have to gauge your motor response just the right way to make the ball go into the into the basket so that's a extraordinary uh, feat and, and or, or take baseball when, when you throw a, a baseball you know 100 miles an hour 67 feet it gets across the baseball plate in you know two or three hundred milliseconds but it takes 500 milliseconds to even see something so they have to hit the ball before they even literally see the ball so that's really fast and the visual system evolved to be of course really fast so that you can uh, you know avoid collision with the items flying at you etc so, uh, so we studied baseball players because we thought, well, they, they have to have this really fast vision, but we know that young, young guys have terrible diets. They just eat pizza and drink you know, soda all day. So we, uh, we did an intervention where we improved their diet and, uh, and then measured this processing speed and was able to, to affect a very significant change in, the, in, in their processing speed, even in these really young 19-year-old people who already have ridiculously fast processing speed. So, so you were able to improve their hitting and their fielding, or was it we yeah. just looked at hit, hitting? Well, so what we did is we, we, we did this in the lab. So this wasn't a field study, but um, so we didn't measure their statistics. I mean, this is one of the things that we, we uh, chose baseball players for is because they keep fairly careful uh, statistics, you know, like looking at batting averages, et cetera. So, uh, but it's hard to, uh, 
you know, it, it, it's hard to get a proper control when you have just baseball players on the field. And so what we wanted to do is in the lab so we could use normal undergraduates that weren't playing athletes and, and, and how, we, how we tested it in the lab as we took basically lights and we streaked them down a wall and they would, they would go down this wall at various speeds. And then we could, we'd have them hit a button when it reached a specific target location. And then we could measure it extremely precisely because then you know everything was automated and we could measure it. But so it's a lot harder to do, do it on the field all the environmental conditions are, are changing. And a lot of this stuff also is neurological, but it's also optics. You know, it, a lot of these things change, uh, change optics. So for example, uh, a, a, a baseball is white and, and it's often caught on a, on a blue sky background. And that, the, 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 the peak wavelength of the blue sky is 460 nanometers. And that's the peak wavelength of also uh, lutein and zeaxanthin in the retina. So lutein and zeaxanthin in the retina are these plant pigments from green leafy vegetables, and they concentrate right in the macula of the eye, and they're, they're exactly optimal to absorbing skylight. So if you're looking at a white ball on a blue sky, they'll absorb the background more than the target, so that it increases the contrast between the two. So that makes you see an object in the real world better and increases your, how far you can see. So it's sort of optimized to environmental conditions. But when you're trying to study that on the field, the conditions are changing so rapidly, it's hard to control them experimentally. So we, we usually recreate it in the lab just so we have control over everything. So you were able to improve the baseball players in the lab with their temporal processing speed. Correct. And uh, so how much lutein and zeaxanthin did you give them or what diet did you give them and what did you take away? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And, and uh, we, what, what we tend to do in a lot of our supplement studies, so we've done a number of studies using supplements. And I've done studies, by the way, where we also use real food like spinach, where we'll use that as the, as the intervention. But, um, but it's, it's sometimes easier to use supplement simply because it's, it's hard to store food and measure food and et cetera. So we'll, uh, we'll also do just pure supplement studies. But the, the standard dose is about 12 milligrams. So about 10 milligrams of uh, lutein and two milligrams of zeaxanthin. You and know, I've off, and you found that that was able to help the ball players? Yes. Yep. And, and it's, and you know, we've just done a number of other sites, studies where we measure uh, cognition and older people and younger people and you know just a variety of conditions where we've uh, measured other aspects of neurological function so processing speed is one thing but processing speed in, in in psychology is known as sort of a cognitive fundamental so there's a lot of things that spring from co from uh, processing speed like short-term memory and problem solving and just a, a number of cognitive executive functions that processing speed is a fundamental uh, characteristic of. The faster you can process, the more information you can take in, the more you can, the quick, more quickly you can uh, cogitate it, I, I mean, et cetera. So what we've done is we've measured those other things as well in other studies where we'll have a placebo and a, and a lutein and zeaxanthin uh, treatment condition. And it really impacts uh, a, a variety of things. I, I have a nine-year-old who plays baseball, and a, a nine-year-old boy who plays baseball. And if you had a nine-year-old that played baseball, what would you recommend for him or her to improve their baseball ability? Yeah, so, well, I, I think that, uh, you know, supplements are fine, but they're, uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the idea behind supplements, just generally, is that they're supplementary. You know, they're additive to a good diet. And if you look at usually the recommendations of most major groups, they say, oh, you know, supplements are okay, but really what you want is just a really good diet. And, 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 and of course, nowadays, it's really hard to get a really good diet, especially because the, the, uh, you know, so many wild varieties of food aren't in our, our, uh, 
our dietary repertoire anymore. So to use one example, and I'm getting to the question, but uh, milk, milk thistle has uh, got a lot of somarin in it. And somarin is just great for your liver. I mean, it's unequivocally wonderful for your liver. But how often do you eat milk thistle, you know? And so I think that the, historically, the, the, the hunter-gatherer diet had just a ton of different varieties of food and and you know they'd walk 19 miles a day and etc. So so the question is with the modern diet, are you able to get the the variety and amount of uh, nutrients that you once could? So for example, it would be pretty easy for a for a hunter and gatherer to have 100 milligrams of lutein with zeaxanthin in their diet. I mean, a couple of what amounts to a nice salad now would do it, but. Back in the day, of course, greens even had more lutein in them than, than the domesticated varieties that you see now. So, so that was sort of the diet we had you know, for 100,000 years. And so, so probably that's optimal, I mean, to, to, to put it in that sort of paleo context. So, so what I would want to do, and you know, it, it's, this is what I sort of did with my kid, it, kids, I, I had a, uh, like a Nutribullet, and I'd put greens in there and some strawberries in there and etc. cetera, and, and try to use that as the delivery vehicle so they'd like it. And uh, just tried to add greens to their diet that would easily get them 20 or 30 milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthin a day. And by the way, the other crop greens, because there's you know, 20 or so in the body, and each of them are going into different tissues doing different things. So men, for example, the, the red pigment in tomatoes is lycopene, and that goes in the prostate and is good for prostate health. Or uh, beta carotene goes in the corpus luteum of women and is good for, for that. And you know, the other carotenoids go in your skin. And so there's a variety. It's nice to have a natural blend like you get in food rather than just what you get in a supplement. So, so doing that's good. That, I would certainly do that for for my child. It's also the case that kids are uh, pretty deficient in omega fatty acids, vitamin D. You know, if he plays outside, he's getting vitamin D through the skin. But uh, you know, it's shocking how many kids are deficient in some of those just basic uh, components of diet these days. Would you start early with supplementing omega threes? So you know, I have a three year old. And I, I uh, you know, I do. I, it, my, I, she's a really picky eater, so I have a real challenge trying to get her to eat a healthy, healthy food. So I, I occasionally will give her supplements. I, I have a huge drawer filled with them, and I just will occasionally add some to her diet. And uh, you know, they make fish oil supplements that I'll give her occasionally that are fair, that are a little on the lower sugar side. They make them that way. So there's some good sources like that that I'll give her sometimes. She's, she likes fish pretty well, so we can usually get it through fish. What supplements do you actually take? You know, I try to take uh, a variety. I mean, I, like I said, I, uh, I have a variety. I try to have a very good diet. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 56 soon, so I'm really sensitive to these things. But, um, but, but there's a few that I take pretty regularly. Now, one 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 group that I started not too long ago was uh, things that that affect uh, NAD plus levels. So there's you know the the research that the David Sinclair has done out of Harvard has looked at how to affect some of these aging pathways. And one of the one of the more surprising things I think that has come out of aging research in the last in things like recently is that is that aging is a mechanism that's built into cells. You know, so chromosomes have specific genes that regulate the aging process. So if you can affect those, then you can affect the fundamental you know, uh, aspects of aging itself. So NIH started some trials with medications such as metformin, which is a glucophage, to sort of see if taking these, these, these drugs, metformin is a drug that diabetics use to control their sugar levels, but apparently has ancillary genetic effects too. But whether taking those drugs will affect the aging process itself. 
So the, there's little caps on the end of uh, chromosomes called telomeres that will abrade over time. And so they can look at telomere length and uh, mTOR pathways, et cetera. So, so there, it turns out that there's some supplements that may affect those as well. So usually they, they're derivatives of vitamin B. And uh, so there's a lot of interest right now in that. Um, I'll occasionally take a lutein supplement or other carotenoid supplements. I'll occasionally take a vitamin D3. Something like 80% of the American population is deficient in vitamin D3. Um, I take vitamin K3 sometimes. Vitamin K is, uh, helps the control the precipitation of calcium. So uh, sometimes people develop oxalates and uh, a lot of uh, coronary blockages are caused by uh, calcification. So vitamin, some of the derivatives of vitamin K help control calcification. Um, so I just take a few things like that. Sometimes I'll take a DHEA, which is a precursor hormone, because that's another thing that really declines with age. Um, so I just try to really take a variety of things and not real, not often really regularly, just a little bit, just to, to, so that they're supplements, you know, they, I take, try to have a good diet, but they supplement it basically. You're an expert in macular pigment. You've done lots of research in it. If you could explain macular pigment and how if we increase the macular pigment could actually help people with good vision even become better vision. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so as I mentioned earlier, the, the retina and the brain are, are nutritionally responsive. They change relative to your diet. And I, I, one of the surprising facts, I think, is that just how nutritionally responsive they are. So if you take, take the eyes, for example, if you take an opaque contact lens and put it on the eye and put a little hole in the corner, the photoreceptors will actually grow toward the light. They're phototropic, like plants. So they have a lot of plant characteristics. So they, they absorb some vitamin E very strongly, alpha-tocopherol and the, the rods. Alpha-tocopherol is, is uh, transparent to visible light, but it's very good lipid-based antioxidant. But in the center, we, uh, we concentrate these pigments, as you say, lutein and zeaxanthin, which form the macular pigment. And these are colored, and they, they, they concentrate in the inner layers of the macula. So they're almost like little internal yellow sunglasses. And they, they absorb out more, some of the more deleterious aspects of sunlight, like really short wave blue light. And, and blue light is funny, you know, because we, uh, we, sort of, we, 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 we added on the short wave cone photoreceptor fairly late in our evolutionary heritage to broaden our color vision. But shortwave cones are really susceptible to damage. That's why a lot of uh, ophthalmologists will use shortwave automated chromatry to measure the health of the retina. They, they measure your sensitivity to blue because you lose sensitivity to blue really early on. So, so what macular pigment does is it absorbs out that really energetic uh, damaging light. So it, it, it sort of protects the retina from light damage. So as you can imagine, we have lenses in the front of the eye that's concentrating energy right on the very center of the retina, the macula. And so if you take lenses and, and you know, put it on a paper, you can cause a little fire there because you're concentrating the energy. So the middle of the retina is very susceptible to light damage over a long lifespan. That's why it sort of wears out with age. That's what macular degeneration is. You get a big hole in your vision. So the the first sort of uh, real interest in macular pigment was how does it prevent this major eye disease, macular degeneration? So uh, there was good epidemiological evidence that people who had diets that were high in green leafy vegetables had significantly re reduced risk of macular degeneration. But then it turns out that, you know, of course, we didn't evolve to have a thing to protect us from diseases we got in old age. There should be, there has to be some effect on uh, reproductive fitness early in life in order for things to sort of be maintained through natural selection. So, so we thought, well, okay, what is it doing early 
that's that caused this selective pressure to build up these carotenoids in the in the retina. And visual function and visual motor function was an obvious one. So we started looking at things like how far one can see in the distance. One of the big mysteries in vision science is that you can you can correct people's refraction. So they're in the, in the clinic, they're exactly 20-20 uh, vision, so equal. But then you take them outside and one of them can see about a third farther than the other one. So it's like, why is that? Why is visual range so different? And uh, one idea was that because of Rayleigh scatter in the atmosphere, all this shortwave light interferes with the, with, the, with the perception of distant objects. So by filtering out that shortwave light, you'd allow people to see farther. And so we tested that idea. And, uh, and it turns out that was the case, that you can, by improving how much macular pigment is in the retina, people could see about a third farther than, than it, all things being equal than if they had low levels. Um, so it protects against light damage, it allows people to see further, it, uh, it improves chromatic contrast. So like I mentioned earlier, a lot of things in the real world just naturally are on a blue background because of the blue sky and just the predominant Rayleigh scatter. There's one, one, there's a reason why mountains often look sort of like blue in the distance, like the Blue Ridge Mountains or you know, the Blue Mountains of Hawaii, all these distant objects. So we're often seeing things on a shortwave dominant background, and even if it doesn't re really look all that blue. So by absorbing the background relative to the foreground, it increases contrast, chromatic contrast. So it improves chromatic contrast, kind of like wearing a, yellow uh, ski goggles makes everything look a little brighter. That's uh, makes crisper and that, that's what they they'll do as well. Just better than any or than any external goggles can do it. Um, so there's just a number of optical effects that it has. Then as I said it also of course is concentrating in the brain and uh, in, le in levels high more than other carotenoids do. So your visual cortex preferentially accumulates lutein as does your frontal cortex and various other parts of your brain like your cerebellum and uh, affects brain function. So like vestibular function, your balance, these kinds of things. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. So if we want to help somebody that's very sensitive to light or they're having a lot of glare problems, driving at night, they're having trouble seeing at night, how can we help them? And will increasing macular pigment help these people? Yeah, that, that certainly has been one of the focuses of our studies over time. And you know, the, the, the optics industry is starting to adopt this very approach. So in uh, you know, the 70s, they, they first, when they first started really making uh, good intraocular implants for cataracts, they didn't even have UV, UV absorbing chromophores in them. So people had suffered a ton of light damage. Then they started making clear IOLs implants that would replace cataracts, but they were just completely transparent to visible light. So you had these old, older people, you know, these 70 year olds wearing clear implants. And of course, the only time our crystalline lens was clear was when we were a baby. It gets yellowed very quickly as you get older. So you have older, you had older people putting in perfectly clear implants as if they were newborn babies, you know? So that was just a ton of light stress and uh, the, the, their, their visual system wasn't quite able to keep with that. So they started making intra, in, intraocular implants yellow so they would absorb blue light. And uh, now contact lenses, there's a variety, there's a, number of contact lenses coming out that are tinted yellow so that they absorb blue light. And, and the idea is that, you know, because the, the broadband light, it's the blue component that's, that's uh, scattering so badly, by absorbing that, you reduce uh, the visual dysfunction that results from really bright light. So if you have a log unit of macular pigment, in your, in your retina, I have a log pigment and macular pigment in my retina. It means that at short, at the, in the blue wave region of the spectrum, you know, maybe only four or 5% of that light is being getting back to my photoreceptors. 
And of course, the visual system adapts to overall light levels, so it's absorbing it, but my sensitivity is not changing. So I can see fine, I see blue just fine, but, I, but it absorbs out the scatter, so I don't have the glare problems. That's the idea. And so we've done a number of studies on this and shown that to be the case. And when I say we, I mean our lab has done it and now a number of other labs have shown this as well. So this is a pretty unequivocal finding. The nice thing about a lot of these studies is they can be done using uh, randomized double control, you know, placebo controlled techniques. So we can give patients a placebo or a lutein supplement and then measure their glare uh, function with time and show, even though it's double blinded, that the ones that received the lutein supplement actually have the improvement. So it's a, we can use that kind of elegant study. And, we, and those people will be able to see better when they're driving and driving at night, even though they have pretty good vision normally. That's right, that's exactly right. And one, one thing that happens is that people forget that even though you have really good vision under normal circumstances, it can be a very different thing when you're under uh, more uh, different aversive conditions. So for example, a lot of people will get uh, laser corrections for myopia. And what they'll do is they'll go in and they cut their cornea, you know, they take the outer flap and they laser the middle of the cornea and shorten the axial length and that will correct their myopia. But the problem is when they cut their cornea, that scatters light just terribly. So sometimes when people get laser corrections, it causes them really bad scatter glare problems. Same with, uh, same with cataract uh, extraction and implantation. When you take out the old uh, lens, you often leave the capsule and then the implant goes within the capsule. But the junction between the, the implant and the capsule can be very rough. So that also just scatters a ton of light. Plus again, they're cutting the cornea. So imagine you have a lens and you cut it. You have a big scratch on the lens. So that just scatters light like crazy. So a lot of people have perfectly good acuity and great daytime vision, but terrible glare problems when they drive at night because of these interventions that were fixed everything else, basically. And of course, just the older you get, the more your lens starts having little you know, Jane 80s and you know, uh, vacuoles, and et cetera, et cetera, that scatter light. When we're outside and we have we get sunlight, we get ultraviolet light, we get blue light, we get infrared light, we're getting the full spectrum of light. But when I'm sitting here looking at the computer, I'm getting mostly blue light. How dangerous is that to my eye and and how dangerous is it maybe to my brain? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, there's been a lot of concern because people are staring at devices all day and computer screens all day and and and, and it, it, it's, so here's the part that is not as much of a concern. That one is that if you measure the amount of, say, energy coming off my monitor as I'm looking at it right now, and compare that just to the amount of light coming in through the side window, there's way more energetic light coming through that window than there is the monitor or my iPhone. So there's just not a lot of energy coming out of these things. So. And, and if, you, if you can imagine it this way, imagine I turned off all the lights in the room, but I had my iPhone on in its brightest setting. I mean, it wouldn't light up the room even as much as a light bulb would, or, or my computer monitor was opening, because it's just not emitting all that much light per se. So it's not damaging from a light damage perspective. I mean, I could, I could set my, my monitor on its highest blue output and stare at it all day and I'm not gonna get tan on my skin because it's just not that much light. Now, if I go outside, even if it's cloudy, I'm getting quite a bit of UV light. So, so, it's, so from, a, from a just quantity perspective, light damage is not, is not a huge issue with monitors and artificial devices. And now, having said that, a lot of the new LED lighting uh, has a lot more shortwave light than it ever did. And, and so, so what, one of the big revolutions in the lighting industry was the invention of the blue LED. Because before that, and that was only you know in the 90s, before that all you had is the red and green LED, and so you couldn't render white light. So as soon as they invented the blue LED, remember that guy won the Nobel Prize for this, and I was like, what in the world, the Nobel Prize? But, 
The reason was because suddenly you could make white light from LEDs. So that just revolution, revolutionized color rendering. Monitors got better, TVs became cheaper, uh, lighting became longer lasting. I mean, LED lights will, don't make much infrared, so they'll last like 100,000 hours, et cetera. But it made a lot more blue light. And, and the blue light doesn't necessarily just cause light damage. It also affects your circadian rhythms. So one obvious uh, negative uh, fact of all that was that people started looking at their iPhones when they wake up in the middle of the night, et cetera. And just the amount of blue light was enough to affect circadian rhythms. So we have uh, cells in our retina that respond to short of light and process melanopsin, which is a hormone that helps regulate uh, an area of our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. And that regulates uh, our sleep-wake cycles. Earlier I had said how photoreceptors are like plants, but a lot of, the, a lot of human biology is also set by just light. That's why ironically the sun can be healthy in a lot of ways too because we have little pigments like cytochrome oxidase in every cell of our body that respond to light. We evolved in real sunlight. So it, there's some real healthy benefits of sunlight too. So, uh, so what happens though is that when people, you know, what we were made to do is be outside a lot of the day and then go into an extremely dark place to sleep, like a cave. So, uh, so people have found that if you make your bedroom like a cave, kind of cold, pitch black, you know, you just sleep a lot better. And you, and you want that because you don't want light uh, affecting the release of melatonin by your, by your pineal gland. So uh, light suppresses the release of melatonin. So you want a lot of melatonin being released when you're sleeping. And of, and of all the light that affects this, this circadian rhythm, blue light is particularly bad. So you work with a lot of novel technologies. I think you've helped develop some. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, well, so one of the, the, the newest things in medicine now is, the, is really personalized medicine. And, and so, you, you, uh, you know, the, the, the days of just standard treatments that are given to everybody are starting to go to, 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 to close because people have recognized that every condition is heterogeneous. So, you know, my macular degeneration might be very different than your macular degeneration. You might have gotten it because you were a boater and was in the sun all the time. I may have gotten mine because of poor diet, or this person over here might have got them because it was completely her hereditary. So each form is a little different than the other form and responds to things differently, obviously. So, so my blood pressure might be caused by psychological stress, Yours might be caused by genetics. That person's might be caused by too much sodium. But the, the approach to each has to be very individual. So how do, you, how do you tailor treatment to an individual? And one way is to, make, is to measure things about that individual so that you know, very, you know specifics for that person. So, uh, so a lot of biotechnology is, is aimed at measuring things very specific and, and doing it in a way that uh, allows uh, change in treatment. Here, here's just another example. Like in the old days, if you have type two diabetes, you, you, me you measure your glucose and you, and you take your insulin. But of course, the way the, the pancreas works is on a second by second basis. If you, it, you know, it's regulating your insulin release in a very fine-tuned way to variations in your body. So all, all endocrine glands work this way. So if you just take a big pill, that's very different than a, than a dynamic second-by-second -second changing internal gland. So, so how can you measure glucose dynamically and, and uh, your insulin delivery dynamically to, so, so that it's better suited to variations in the individual. So for example, they've, they've created implantable in, uh, glucose monitors and they'll, they'll hook up with your iPhone 
and give you a readout of exactly how your glucose is, is varying. They're making new contact lenses that include biosensors that'll measure glucose levels in your lacrimal fluid and other things about your biology, by the way, that give sort of instant readouts. And then what you can do is you can vary the treatment based on more information. So we've done things like measure, use devices that can measure macular pigment and exactly how much an individual has in a real non-invasive, very easy, quick way. We have, we have devices that measure temporal processing speed. So we can get very specific measures of how that is. Um, dysphotopsia. Dysphotopsy is a kind of glare where if you're outside, lights have a little halo around them and spokes. So that's a, a kind of glare that becomes very worsened with laser corrections or cataract extraction. So if we, if we measure them and measure how bad they are, then we can say, okay, well, here's what you should do to reduce this specific problem with glare that you have. Or photostress recovery, you know, you, you expose someone to a really bright light and then measure just how long it takes them to see again. And that's more metabolic because it's caused by photopigment bleaching and then photopigment having to regenerate. So uh, very, you can, by measuring things very specifically, you can figure out exactly what's wrong for the individual and then, you know, more precisely what to do. You've done studies to show that the amount of pigment in the eye, the macular pigment, correlates very well with the pigment in the brain. And could, and could affect cognition. Can you talk a little bit about that and what people could do to actually help that if they're starting to maybe forget where they're putting their keys or they're starting to get macular degeneration and how their macular degeneration and losing your keys, forgetting where your keys are may be related? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So, the, uh, so the, the, first, the first observation to your point is that the... Uh, often the retina is reflecting things going on in the brain. And, and that makes sense because the retina is part of the central nervous system too. So the, the retinal blood barrier is just like the brain blood barrier. And a lot of things are similar that pass between the two. So it's often the case that things that are going on in the retina are, are pretty uh, precisely mirrored by things that are going on in the brain. So in the case of lutein, we measured the amounts in the retina. And if you correlate it, to the amounts in the brain, and there have been anatomical studies of that sort, then uh, you know, the correlation is almost perfect. You know, we're, we're looking 0 0.8, 0 0.9 in terms of the strength of the correlation. So, so that means that we can measure the amounts in the retina, and we don't have to do anatomy on the brain and measure the brain, because the two go together real well. So that allows us to look at living subjects and measure it dynamically and change it and measure changes. So, so how routine works in the retina is obvious. It's filtering light, etc. How it works in the brain is obviously not filtering light in the brain. What it's doing in the brain is that a few things we think. One is that you know, if, you, if you can imagine uh, cellular membranes, they're lipid rich, have a lot of fat in them. Like I said, the brain has a lot of fat in it. Um, and they, these are fat soluble uh, dietary components. They're fat, fat. So what they do is they absorb in this fat and what, they, what they've been shown to do in, in cellular studies is connect cells laterally so that they work more efficiently together. So one thing about brains, especially as you're aging, is efficiency matters. So for example, they've, they've looked at people who, with neuroimaging studies, who just are very high functioning and older. And what, they, what they've noticed is that people who are very higher functioning when they're older use more brain to do the same thing. So people that aren't, so you can do neuroimaging while someone's solving a complex problem. And if they're low functioning, they just use one little part of the brain, just like young people do. But if they're higher functioning, what they do is they use more parts of their brain. So, so they'll use a lot, both sides of their brain will activate as opposed to just one little area. And, and what's, what they're doing is they're compensating for loss by using more of their brain for any given thing. That's why things like learning to play the piano is so useful when you're older, because it sort of forces you to use a part of your brain that you haven't used before, and then it starts getting your brain used to use 
using a lots of activation. So what lutein does is it helps these, these neurons uh, work together more efficiently so that that kind of it, it helps that uh, compensatory mechanism. It's, it's the, 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 the real key principle is that the more brain you use, the better off you are. And again, one reason why exercise, uh, certain exercises are so good for older people, like balancing exercises, is it forces them to use parts of their brain they don't use before, they haven't used before. So for example, the, the cerebellum is this little part in the back of your brain here, and it's, it's responsible for complex motor movements and balance, but that's like 10% of your brain, but 50% of your neurons are in your cerebellum because complex movement is so important to the brain. So by older people doing things like learning to play the piano, they get this huge brain, you know, that benefits their brain just generally. Excellent, excellent. So, yeah. if, so if somebody's going to take lutein to, to help them, how much lutein, how much zeaxanthin would you recommend a day if they're gonna take a supplement? And how do we know what's a good supplement, what's a bad supplement? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So, uh, so the best way, and, and this is true, this is generally true of many supplements, not all of them, by the way, but the, the, obviously the best way is food. So if you can make a green smoothie, great. You know, put different kinds of greens in it, spinach, kale, etc. cetera. Then you, you can easily get 30, 40 milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthin. If you're going to take a purified supplement in pill form, First of all, obviously you have to take it with a fat source, so it's absorbed. These are fat soluble uh, uh, nutrients. And, uh, and, and you know, the standard dose that they come in is about 10 to 12 milligrams, which is a great, that's a, that's a good amount. The, the average intake for most Americans is about two milligrams a day, which is horribly low. Like if I had a, if I had a cup of uh, a big, say I had a big glass of, of spinach, you know, that's, that's more greens than an average American will get in a month. So the, the average, I, I saw this survey once and it, not, uh, last year and it was like, if you, if you take away uh, potato chips and french fries, almost half of Americans have no vegetables at all, like none. The, the average intake of vegetables in America is just, abysmally bad so it, it's it's hard to overemphasize just how bad it is so uh, so 10 to 12 milligrams is you know six seven times more than than, than the average american gets in a, in a given day so uh and and as far as the quality of the supplements actually in this category most of them are pretty good because the, there's not that many uh manufacturers of lutein so in, in a lot of other areas a lot of different companies make them, but in, in the case of lutein, there's just not that many sources for supplements uh, makers to buy their lutein from. So they usually buy it from about the same one and that one's very good. So it's, it's frankly, they're, they're, they're all pretty good. When a patient goes into their optometrist and the optometrist is looking and examining the patients, what are some of the things that the optometrist could see inside somebody's eye that could be a tip off that they may be starting to, that they may be at risk for Alzheimer's or dementia. Yeah, that, so so a lot of the uh, classic markers of degeneration in the retina are, are are comorbid with with other degenerative forms. I mean, the if you can imagine, so the retina of course is extraordinarily vascularized. That's why it looks so red. So. Uh, because it's got a dual blood supply in the back, which is called the choroid, and the anterior vessels in the front. So when people get red eye in camera, that's just the blood in their eye that's being reflected back from the flash of the camera. So there's a ton of blood. So cardiovascular diseases are very comorbid with, with retinal degeneration too, which is also comorbid with dementia in the brain, because the brain also has a ton of vasculature. So, so the retina is a really good indicator of almost all degenerative conditions, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. When people have 
proto-diabetes, you know, the, their cells are becoming insensitive to insulin, so sugar can't get in them. So that really impacts metabolically active tissues like the retina a lot. So they, they, the, what the retina will do is send out signals to blood vessels to grow, and they'll grow to supply more blood, hence more sugar, and they'll break. So you see little breakages in the retina, little microaneurysms, as you've indicated. And so that's, that's a big sign. You, the retina will try to heal itself, just like other tissues do. So you can see scarring in the retina, just these little disciformed scars. Uh, drusen is basically oxidation, oxidized lipids. So uh, one of, there's two big uh, aging pro, uh, phenomena. One is oxidative stress, and the other is chronic inflammatory stress. So when I teach health in my class, I was like, we talk about that a lot, like oxidative stress. I mean, we're adapted to breathe oxygen, but oxygen is a very reactive gas. I mean, it rusts metals. I mean, if you hit an oxygen truck, it explodes. You know, it's, I think if, if aliens ever came to the earth, they'd be shocked that we breathe oxygen. You know, if you go way, way, way back in the history of the planet, plants made oxygen to kill other plants as a weapon. And then those plants developed antioxidants to protect them from that stress. So we, uh, we piggybacked on a billion year evolutionary protection of plants and, and evolved to use oxygen in this way. But still, oxygen damages the system. That's why our body incorporates antioxidants literally everywhere. We make antioxidant enzymes inside the cell. We absorb antioxidants from all the plants we eat. And so, uh, so one biomarker of the retina that's really significant is indications of oxidative stress. So the crystalline lens will become cataractous as it oxidizes. Um, the retina will form drusen, these little oxidized yellow spots that you can see in a fundus examination. Those are all big clinical signs. The more healthy the retina looks when you look at it, that's a great sign of a healthy individual. How could eye doctors use the lens of the eye as a bio, biomarker for chronic disease? Because we know everybody's going to get cataracts as they get older. So maybe everybody when they're older is getting this chronic disease. But is there a part of the lens that will break down first or form a cataract before a different part that shows us that somebody's at risk for Alzheimer's? Yeah, so, so, so the short answer is yes. Yeah. So the, the, the lens, uh, you know, as you say, everybody, the lens ages in everybody. I mean, one reason why it, people become press biopic or need reading glasses when they're you know, 50 or in the late 40s is that it sort of adds a layer every as you grow as you develop and so there's not a lot of room in there so it can't change shape anymore but so it just gets more dense and so it doesn't because it can't accommodate to objects we start needing to wear reading glasses and that's that's just a growth process that occurs with everybody what isn't a growth process is the oxidation of the proteins so when the crystalline proteins oxidize they get yellow and more opaque, and then that blocks light going in. And so that's when a cataract forms. But how fast that happens is very different. I mean, the, the uh, you know, some people, you can look at some older people, and they have a really pretty clear lens still. And other people, it's completely cataractous. So it's one of those, in, in aging research, they, 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 they refer to some aging phenomena as homo scedastic which is to mean, means to say the kind of variation you see in young people is about the same as the kind of variation you see in old people. Presbyopia is an example of that. Some age functions though are called heteroscedastic, which is to say young people don't have very much variation, but old people have a ton of variation. So take liver function. I, I could go measure the liver function of all my college students, and it's pretty much the same. They're all young, they all have optimal liver function. I could do the same thing and measure a bunch of 60 year olds and there'd be some that would have liver function like the 20 year olds, not very different at all, and some that are showing huge loss. 
what aging researchers like myself do is they say, okay, what's the difference between the guy, the people showing all this liver function loss and the ones that have young livers like the young people? And usually that relates epidemiologically to, to lifestyle behaviors. You know, this, these people drink a lot or whatever. So, uh, so, so that's the same with the lens. I can measure the, the optical density of, uh, of the crystalline lens in a sample of young, very young people, and it's you know not that different. They're all clear. I could go to a bunch of 50-year-olds, and the, some are almost as clear as young people, and others are really dense, approaching, you know, and they're, they're the ones that are gonna ca get cataract much earlier. So uh, everyone is gonna get cataract, but a lot of people die before that ever happens because it's developing so slowly. I mean, if we all live to 120, probably everyone would have one, but the rate is very different and reflects how your lifestyle, frankly. I guess with diabetes, people age quicker, and that's why they get cataracts about 10 years sooner than non-diabetics. Yeah, that's right. And I also, sometimes they'll, they'll, uh, they'll basically, what used to be called, uh, they'll get a sugar lens. They get a lot of glycation end products that form in their lens, and so it's not just it, it's, it is oxidation in diabetics, but it's not only oxidation. They'll have these glycation end products that sort of start building up in their lens as well. In the ARAD study, which was a, a big study that you know about uh, uh, for many years that where they look at people with macular degeneration, they also look at people with cataracts. And you, people that got cataracts younger had cancer, were more, were more likely at risk for cancer. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, and the, the, the basic reason is, is just as we mentioned, another big major uh, uh, etiological factor or, or causative factor in cancer is oxidative damage to the DNA. So cell division is, is regulated by uh, proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So these genes that uh, will regulate this, how the cell divides. But <clears throat> oxidative stress will hit this, those genes. And every time they get a hit, it accumulates until the cell can become cancerous. That's why really subtle things, like I read a study a few years ago where people who use really bright alarm clocks had higher incidence of cancer relative to people that did not use those kind of alarm clocks. And the reason they, they, they speculated in the study was that the light was suppressing the release of melatonin while they were sleeping, and melatonin is an antioxidant. So by being in a really dark room, they had more melatonin, hence more antioxidant protection over time, and that translated to, 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 to better uh, cancer rates. So, uh, so there's a lot of cancers, you know, there's hundreds of cancers, but many are related to dietary behavior and smoking and you know, those things that improve, uh, that increase oxidative stress lead to higher cancer rates. Those things that decrease oxidative stress tend to lead to lower. I hope that's not the case with the digital devices that we're looking at, that you could compare that with the, uh, with the, with the alarm clocks, because then yeah, there's yeah. a lot of cancer. Well, that's right. And, and you know, I mean, uh, to, to your point, a lot, of, a lot of things about convenience and modern life are probably not very healthy. I mean, we have, we've made things very easy for ourselves. You know, I drove to work this morning and my car warmed my rear end even. So, but think about that. I mean, I don't have to spend even a calorie regulating my internal temperature. I, you know, my, my, my environment is, does it for me. I don't, I, you know, I don't have to develop an arch in my foot because my shoes have an arch. You know, we, we've, we've made everything so uh, easy that, you know, our, you know, my environment is so clean that I don't have to develop much of an immune system in order to, to deal with this. So there's a epidemic of autoimmune diseases, you know, I mean, all the, all the modern life has brought along with it just a ton of problems. I mean, think about the fact that from the optometry perspective, that in a lot of Southeast Asian countries, everyone's myopic. I mean, you go to Hong Kong or Singapore, they're all myopic. 
And how what a how 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 what a what a non-evolutionary fact is that? I mean, we have lower back problems, flat feet, you know, obesity. That the average uh, weight of an adult woman in the United States now is about 166 pounds. An adult man is about 196 pounds. In the in the eight, 70s, 80s, the average adult man was 166 pounds. So it's just you know, I think it's modern life that's causing these issues. It's crazy. Just absolutely it, it, crazy. It is, it is crazy. And it, it's, 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 you know, it's one of the reasons why the American Pediatrics Association says don't, don't even expose your kids to screens before they're two. You know, when their brain is developing, you don't need them developing around that kind of input. You want them developing around the real, you know, the real world. I remember you said in the film, people that are looking here, they have a different type of brain than the people are looking across, that are looking out at, at infinity, at playing outside. Absolutely. I mean, your brain develops around input. You know, I mean, it, that's why, they, they, you know, they used to do these studies with cats where they would put on these kind of goggles so that all they would see is straight lines. And then when they, when they were adult cats, all they can see is straight lines. The brain, you know, it, it's like your lens. Your lens flips everything upside down, but your brain flips it right side up again. Your, your brain develops very sensitively around uh, input. That's why when kids have a strabismic eye, an eye that kind of goes off, it's important to correct it really early. So, or they'll, they'll have what's called amblyopia, a neurological deficit, because of just that one little wandering eye. So it's, uh, the brain is, fantastically sensitive to input. We can learn so much through the eye as far as general health. And we said in the movie, 300 diseases, systemic diseases will show up in the eye. It kind of makes me sad that they, these, these, these disruptors are advertising on the computers that you could get your eyes examined from a cell phone and not to visit and see your eye doctor. How do you feel from a researcher's point of view about seeing those type of things? Yeah, well, you're, you're, you're exactly right. It, it's sort of a, it's reductionism to a ridiculous degree. It's as if that's the only important aspect of, of an eye exam. And, and, and that's just one very small aspect. I mean, the, the, and even, even to the extent of uh, correcting refractive condition, internet technologies are not great for that. You, you really do need you know, the art of optometry. You know, we all love the, the science of optometry, but there is also an art to it, actually. And getting it really well, an, ex an experienced optometrist can do it in a way that, you know, just no one else can. So I, I appreciate the art of the, of the science. But it's also the case that, you know, a, a modern optometrist has a lot of equipment that, that you, you, you can never recreate on the internet. It, Here's just, a, here's just an example, you know, as we mentioned, like about light damage with screens, you know, real light is very different than light in the screen. So if I wanted to measure photo stress recovery and I tried to do it with a computer monitor, it would basically be impossible because the, the kind of light used in the monitor isn't like the kind of light people will be experiencing in a real world setting. So sunlight, you might be able to simulate the look of sunlight, but it isn't like sunlight. It's just these little peaks of light. So uh, you can never measure macular pigment on a, on a, on a monitor. You, there's a ton of things you can never do with, on the internet. That's why in the lab we build these really huge giant optical systems with xenon gas and all these lenses and, because you have to do that, actually make real light like, like you get from the sun. So my last question, Dr. Hammond, you're such a wealth of information and knowledge and you've taught us doctors so much that we're able to help the people with, the public with. Uh, what should people look for? And this is a very difficult question because I get this question when I'm showing the film to critics and then there's a question and answer. And this is a question they always ask me. How do we know if somebody, or how do we find a good optometrist? What should we look for? Yeah, I mean that's a, that is a that is a good question. I mean, I I think that uh, you know if, if it, to sort of spiral it out for a second, 
the uh, when I was in when I was in medical school, the uh, you know you learn you learn the basics of medicine, and then and then people go off and they 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 become practicing doctors. Some practicing doctors can almost don't learn anything past that point. That's that that's where they stop, you know. So a good doctor, just like a good optometrist, doesn't do that. They they stay current. They they read. They watch documentaries like the one you produce. They they're intellectually interested, you know, not just in the in their business practice, but actually in 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 the in the possibilities and, uh, of optometry. So they 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 they're forward looking. They're well they're well educated on what's going on in the field. I mean, I think that I think you can really tell those who who do it sort of as a nine to fiver and those who do it as a as an intellectual interest and, and those are two entirely different things so if somebody wants to find you dr hammond and they're interested in your work how can they go about doing that oh sure so uh i'm a professor here at the university of georgia i have a little web page we all we all do um my email address is uh b hammond at uga.edu and I welcome any emails anytime. I love to, to I love to talk about the stuff that we do and, and just help in general. So uh, you so either on the on the internet I'm easy to find or or email me anytime. Well thank you for visiting with us and thank you for sharing your big extensive knowledge with our audience. Thank well, you so much. No, thanks for making this great documentary. I, even though I'm kind of in it for a little bit, I still really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had safe for you to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with safe for you. And most importantly, the reason why I buy safe for you is because it's safe for me and you.